to hear some of the some of the uh, like New Orleans kind of thing, like that beat you played the thing you played earlier, like I don't know leaves and. and well, that's not New Orleans. Yeah. Well, yeah. where I'd like to know. New Orleans was Dick Stick up there. Was there. Okay. That's New Orleans. How about the, you know, like the Tapatine, Yeah, like Poinciana and, yeah. uh, and uh, Autumn Leaves and uh, Love for Sale. Yeah, like where, where is that coming from? Okay, that's, uh, that's a mixture of everything that I ever heard. I didn't invent that. It just came out of me. But it's a mixture. Just lucked up and got a mix of everything I ever heard. You can hear a little bit of everything. You can hear a little bit of New Orleans, a little bit of Chicago, a little bit of New York, a little bit of Latin, a little bit of... You understand? You can hear everything in that. Uh, I can't say where that came from. Exactly. But it came from... It's a, just a big mixture. You know, you keep listening. You see what I mean? You keep listening. Then that's where the technique comes in. See, if you got technique, if you study technique and, 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 and playing the instrument, you know, then sooner or later yourself will come out. In other words, you're getting some stuff from me now, right? So you study that. Then you, that don't, but that don't stop you from studying out a certain such book and going such and such a cat, you know, for maybe some other expertise or some. It's like you go to two doctors, you know, you go to one and one don't tell you what you really want to hear, you get them to, they tell you not to get a second opinion. You know, well, that's also good, you know. But points you and all that just came out of a, well, what you call it came out of a cha cha. Uh, autumn leaves.
main thing is that's going to be a hard one. Just do it constantly. Right. Work it the down. same thing constantly. See, when you master that, then get another beat. Get another. What about what you did on uh, extension to the sterile Where you got a tambourine? Oh, yeah. You got a tambourine? I got a tambourine. Well, that was, uh, I was hitting that on the side of my leg. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sinatra, several players. <laughs> So you concentrate now the day, now the first time you make a mistake on that, you do, you see? Right. But when you know where one is, mm -hmm. one is the most important thing. One. Mm -hmm. So you know where one is, so you're one, two, three, four. <laughs> in there the opportunity to hear a lot of people play for free. So you might cost you twenty, twenty five dollars, you know what I mean? So you gotta be selective of who you want to hear. But at one time you hear everybody free, see. Right. So that's a wealth of information you get. Not only that uh, uh, the rapport amongst musicians was different then. You understand what I mean? I had no fear. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I knew Mike could do a lot of things better than me, but there was a few things I could do better than you, so I'd stay within my realm. If you jumped in my realm, you were in trouble. You see what I mean? So what I'd do is I'd stay in my realm until I could broad myself. I would never jump into your realm. You know what I'm saying? But musicians had, but uh, there was always a competitive, my vicious. I want like this like now, I help you. Mm -hmm. I'll say to you when you come to the house and I'll give you whatever knowledge I have. Sometimes you pay, sometimes you don't, right? Okay. Uh, but now you, you don't get that. Even if you pay, you don't get it. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So what you want to do is you want to start playing the tunes now. You want to start broadening your knowledge. In other words, when you're on the bandstand and a guy calls uh, Chase the Bird, okay? Okay, now horn players, they generally know most of Charlie Parker's too. They should anyway. Right. You know what I mean? So they try to call something that might be fuddled who's up on the bandstand, you know what I'm saying? So it's catch a lot of noise after that, oh man. And then they'll call some simple truth, which would be really wanted to play in the first place. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So it's best that you have a knowledge of and listen to as much as you possibly can. Yeah. And if you can't play the tune, play the sound. It's play the form of the standards. Play the form of the, of the standards. See, like most tunes are based off the standards. Mm -hmm. The old tunes, not now. Everything happens now. Two of the nine balls and two beats. And nine balls and four, four, one ball, two, four, one ball, three, four. You know, they try to make things so difficult. Of course, uh, that's the way they want it. You know, that's, that, that's that problem. Right. You guys have any questions? Well, you know that that, uh, that uh, autumn leaves be. Mm -hmm. What you're doing really is actually just playing double time. Right. You know what I'm saying when you go into the fast thing, you just play double time, but it's the same tempo. Right. With the left, the left hand is playing double time. Left hand is on the end of the beat. Yeah. Left hand is on the sock symbol, so that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Left hand sock symbol. Sometimes it makes it harder because. 
you're not used to your left hand and your socks ever coordinating. Right. You're used to them doing that opposite thing. So sometimes it's restrictive. Mm -hmm. But that's all it is. It's, a, it's on the hand of the beat. Don't keep your patient on going. In the hand, you don't have to do what I do. You know, you do what you can do now. And as you keep doing it, then you'll find you, you know, don't try to do too much. Keep one, one steady beat. I, I think I kept one steady beat for maybe the whole thing. I might change here and that just to mm -hmm. something might come to mind. But generally, it's the same thing, you know. Because right. uh, in drums, believe it or not, it's repetition, repetition of the pulse that does the excitement. It's not a whole lot of bullshit. Just to keep straight repetition, because the old guys, they never played no bomb drop, uh, you know, natural style, but they still swamp. Right. You understand what I'm saying? It's the pulse that, uh, Okay. I say I'm going to sing this. Um. Okay, why don't you play a tune for me now, see, what, see if you got the idea of what I'm talking about. I'll play, I'll play the same tune. Tell me what you're playing. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now's the, now's the time? Yeah. Four more intro? Okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> So what you're actually doing is you're playing a 
same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. The only person I know that can get away with that is our Blake. Okay? Right. That's his thing. So the originator can always get away with the original. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to free yourself up, you know, from now on, and when you practice, you know, don't worry about the tingling, tingling, tingling. Mm -hmm. okay. Just make sure you always know where one is. See, right now, you're sure of one or three. You don't know which one it is sometimes, but you know it's either one or three because you're using the bass drum. Okay, now how do you prove where it's at? With the bass player. Right. You start listening to the changes he's making. Mm -hmm. Understand what I'm saying? Okay. See, I, I used to listen to Ahmed, but I used to listen to Israel. See, Israel and I were a team. Mm -hmm. We were reinforcement father. See, Ahmed could go where he wanted to go. Because Israel was such a great musician, he was always there. And I know Israel was always there, I just stayed with Israel, right or wrong. Right. You understand? Until I, until I got the musical knowledge enough to know that when when he was right or wrong, which was in, took a long time, you know, he was very something wrong. So I mean, you coordinate with the bass player, and that gives you more freedom. Mm -hmm. Because you want freedom too. Did you ever like that? You ever, since you knew it was so solid as a bass player, did you ever like kind of try to s stretch different places, or were you all, you know, like forwards and backwards behind him sometimes? Or, or, well, he would just he, keep playing. You got to speak a little Did you ever like, you know how he's so solid, Israel? Yeah. And like, you guys could really hook up yeah. together. Mm -hmm. But did you ever, I mean, was there times where when you're playing where you would like, you know that he'd be staying solid and you would kind of, move backwards and forwards on his beat or were you you guys pretty well, much always trying to with him it? with him I was the freest that I've ever been because I didn't I didn't have to worry about uh, he took he took a lot of responsibility off of mine. Right. <coughs> uh, I haven't met anybody like him since he died. There's a few cats around that could do it, you know. They want to do it. But uh, during his time there were many guys. Paul Chambers, uh, Jimmy Garrison, uh, oh, many, many, Sam Jones, many guys that do that, that you can depend upon, you can work with as a team. Right. Uh, now, the bass players are like uh, half cellist and half violinist. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, uh, as the question goes, yes, he freed up, he freed me up a lot. Yeah. Yeah, because I could depend upon him, see, because when I came back in, when I, you know, when I got lost, maybe not lost, but mentally, you know, sometimes, I don't know, if you haven't gotten this way yet in your life, but sooner or later, if you keep playing music long enough, uh, uh, you're sore, your mind is sore, you go into another area, another, another, uh, uh, I guess you would say here, another atmosphere, you know, but it's a spiritual thing, you go to a higher spiritual level, so your mind will come with all kinds of things, you know. And you know when you go out there, you can always get back because all you have to do is check with the bass player, see where he's at. If you don't know what the count is, you can always check with the bass player. You know exactly where he is because if you're using your foot like I thought, Harlan, you always know where one and three is. You have no 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 doubt about that. You might not know which one is three and which one is one. You understand? But it's better to know two out of four than not know none at all. Out of four beats or six beats, whatever tempo you're playing. Playing six eights, it's still one and four, but it's still one and you know it's two beats on the bass drum. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, right? Uh, you have a trouble in five four. You got to always know where one is. You understand? Know and some of the difficult times, but most times you know one and three are always on the on the bass drum. So I guess to answer your question. Well, you're pretty much answered. Hmm? Pretty much answered. Yeah. With a good bass player, you're very free. Same thing with a bass player, with a good drummer. You see, because when you interject things, you don't just interject things because you don't have anything to do. You want to have a purpose for interject, interjecting something. You know, like if you can hear the bass player's kind of off or wrong or something like that, you know, you interject something to let him know. And he's supposed to have enough respect for you to say, well, I know his one, two, three, four is correct. So I know it's got to be one, two, and you drop down something that that's relative to what you're doing. Guess the word is relative. Of 
but something that that is concerned with what you all doing there. Something that shows you that uh, uh, well, this is like might be playing all the time, you know. Like I might say, boom, boom. Well, he knows one of those two. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey? So then the piano player comes in and gives the reinforcement that he'll lay down the card. He might be lost too. Mm-hmm. It's the drummer's job right. to hold all that shit together. It's his job. You know? And it's not a rewarding job because they don't treat us as musicians. You understand what I'm saying? You know, because you don't know what an A7 flat consists of. Right. All you know how to do is read syncopation, maybe. <laughs> you understand? But the general idea about the drums is playing musically. That's what I'm doing, finally doing now. Uh, playing musically. You know. But I'm able to do that. Like I said, I've been playing 50 years. So, by the time I'm able to do that. You know. But you got so young, so hopefully you do that much earlier than I do because you got much more, even though you don't have the actual visual experience, you have a lot of. Uh, audio experience, you know, you can hear a lot of things, a lot of things, uh, so on the old records you can't, you can't hear a lot of things, you know, you, that's where the, that's where the discrepancy comes in, because with the old records, you're old enough, you could have seen what they were doing, mm-hmm. see like on Blakey's page, you'll never figure out what he's doing, not from listening to him, you have to see him, because he plays by sound. Art has very little technique, but we all use his technique to play. There's not a drummer alive that doesn't play something that other. Art Blaker has more standard mix in the drum world than any other drummer. I don't know if any other drummer has as many standard mix. I mean, st- mix that drummers even never, never, never heard him before will play. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, but he's Art Blaker. You understand what I'm saying? This is one in what? A billion? Uh, that, that makes a big difference. In other words, if you was in China, there would only be one on Blake. You know, it's uh, the world if they had all in one on Blake. You know. Then you had Alvin Jones, and uh, one of my idols was also Jim Cooper. Uh, I like Jim Cooper because uh, uh, Cooper came out with a style that uh, uh, even though it wasn't conducive to really swinging like the cats were swinging, it was clarity. See, when Cooper played, you could write down, you could notate what he was playing. You know, the records, the old records, you could turn them back and play them slow. This Cooper was clean and clear. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't have too many uh, sound things or sound tricks that he used. Most of his things were clear cut. Whenever you hear Cooper, you, you know, you could, you could write down what he was playing. You know? He did some good. He did some great things, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, to me, you know, when I'm coming up, uh, uh, I liked it because of his clarity. That made me want to be clear. You know, that, that showed me that the things that were in the book could swing, mm-hmm. you know, and I started practicing that as such. Uh, but Buddy was a sound player. Buddy Rich was a. This is his clarity was Cooper was about to uh, declare his drummer with technique in a lot of part of his a lot of part of that era. Because Big Shit had a lot of technique, but Cooper was a little more modern, I think, than, than Big Shit. Who else were you listening to a lot of at uh, that time? Who else were you listening to a lot of at that time, like, you know, before your contemporary? Well, my first album was a drummer from New Orleans named Paul Bobberan, who I think was one of the greatest drummers that I ever put put on the planet. Uh, but then when uh, when uh, when Blakey and Max and uh, Roy Haynes and uh, Amongst others, came to see with the new music. They were trying to fit something with the new music. Then I disbanded what I heard before and started concentrating on what was happening at that time. You know I listened to all the drums. We, we all copied. 
broke up. So I you cop it up, you know. If you didn't play with your playing when you got jam, whatever tune they were jamming, if it was a bird tune or a dexter tune or a gene Ammons tune or whoever tune it was, whatever great. Or whoever tune it was, whatever the drummer played on that particular tune, the breaks that he played, the fills that he played, you played those. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And it made sense because you couldn't figure out nothing better to play. <laughs> but when you finally did figure out something better to play, and you took his out. Stash is the computer and you start playing yours. Yeah, now you got two, three things you can play. The his, or the other can be two records come out, somebody else's great might play something else. And then when you formulate and practice those things, then you, as you gradually become more aware of what you're doing, then you maybe you'll be able to insert something of your own. But until then, you copy. Anybody says that they never copied anything, you're a lie. Even Charlie Parker had to study somebody. The only original, the only original there is is God. Everybody else is a communist. Everybody. Bach, Beethoven, Leeds, or Litz, or whatever you call it. Not to derive me the right to but I don't know what to do with it. Thank <laughs> you. 
it. And one symbol, in the middle of the drum, about this big. Right. But they had coconuts. You know what coconuts are? Yeah. That's like a wood block around. They had about four or five coconuts. And uh, tom toms weren't tom toms weren't tunable. They were tacked down, so you had to heat those. Well, they did a decent sound. And, you know, a lot of high hats. Yeah, high hats were always there. But I think in the 30s, so I don't know about it. But you tell me the first high hats was a clap on thing. You don't know what I'm you have to send a clap on it. That's what I heard, I'm not sure. How about brushes? You'll find out where they came from. Huh? You'll find out where the brushes came from. Mm -hmm. Somebody came up with an ingenious idea. Mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, I thought the snap drums came from, uh, you know, the Orleans came from either the French or the English, you know, because they had snap drums. You know? right. Right. But then a guy brought a drum on a thing I didn't know it was not too long ago at the Heritage Festival. A guy brought a drum, an African drum, that had one string on uh, the one third of the drum. And they actually got a snare effect. So that came from Africa too. You know, I was saying, well, I was the was the word theorizing, theorizing or theor theor theorizing, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, the French guy, one of the guys got a little of an old French drum or an old English drum, you know, and that's where the snare drum came from. But it, it came from Africa also. So that means the whole shebang. You know, the drums, you know, not, not, maybe not, well, symbols too. But just the way we do it now, you know, the cultures, the different cultures, so we're playing like that, because that's called the shimmy? No. That's a different? That's a basic Dixie, Dixie beat. That's what you did instead of playing the, instead of playing the, the symbol. That's the way you play it. Okay. But and you're not really, it's not really a, like a role, is it? No. How are you double it? strokes. You, double strokes. You never want to use. Double sticking. You want to use. But double strokes. The only thing you want to pick is a drag roll. You've heard of drag rolls. No drag roll. Uh, because that was instrumental in the snap. See, and that only comes from marches. You see, Dixie came from marches. sound that you played in the beginning. And you can tell if you do it differently. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I would say, uh, <laughs> see, that one was different from the other. See, so you try to duplicate. search for the sticking and the sound. Some of them was double sticking, some of them was single sticking. But never was it up. You see, when I make something double, it's twice I'm hitting. I'm not the only time you want to bounce it is when you can't stick it. If you can't stick it, then bounce it. It's a bounce. That sounds like a sticky because most cats bounce, they get more than what they want. They might want two beats and they'll get three. You know what I'm saying? But when you stick it or try it, when you start learning how to stick it, and even when you bounce it, it comes out like sticky. Is that where you got the, huh? you got the concept from your book? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the concept in the book is to, is to uh, learn you how to, uh, to detect the sound of your drums. Uh, 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 without reading, you first you read it, then you learn how to how to play it by sound. I guess that's what it is. 
And you could, you know, you, you, I have a few things that I do uh, uh, that I like. You know? mm -hmm. And some of them come from, some of them are mixed with the rudiments. And, uh, mm -hmm. That's down to the... It's a single. It's a triple. Yeah. Now you want to do the simplest thing that, that comes out right. You don't want to da 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 not only do I know where one and three are, but I'm old enough now to know where two and four. So I might not say, I might say, see what I mean? Then I bring this up. That's on two. Oh, I know that. That's what you're talking about. Okay. Well, that's like, uh, say, like you said.
when you want to. It's a lot of energy. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that loud. Like I told you now, sometimes when we really, when we really get a groove, I mean a really groove, when it makes you hollow, I don't be playing no saxophone at all. Sometimes it's just a symbol. See, that, that makes the bass player grunt. Makes him get into this. You know? Just play it. Just got to it. <laughs> See what I mean? 
but, but it does just like if uh, it's a big corporation, right? Sears Roebuck. Right? Say you're disgruntled with one of their products. So you just sit around and just be disgruntled. But somebody said, write a letter and say, I'm really disgruntled. And one letter to them complaining there's like a thousand customers. If they receive like 50 letters, you're fired. You understand what I'm saying? That's like 50,000 customers. You follow the same thing? So it's the same thing in music. If you can get somebody that, when we say act a fool, I don't say act a fool. I say get somebody spiritually involved where they have to be physical. That's a great honor. Or if you're playing a dance, or playing for a dance, and you make the people dance. That's an honor. You, know, you don't want to be fucking with a whole lot of tricky shit. I mean, who knows, you know what I mean? They don't know what that is. I mean, you might be playing the most difficult thing in the world, but what do they know? They want to dance. You know, they can't dance off of that. You know, you follow me? So any job you approach, approach it with this. That it's a job that's going to further your career no matter what it is. And you put up with it until you just can't stand it anymore. Okay? Then you look for something else. But don't ever try to outplay the guys that you're playing with. If they can't play, then you, you drop down a couple of levels, you know. But I suggest that you look at something else to do, you know. Because you, you don't want to stay on that level. You want to advance. So you try to find another group where you can advance with it. But in the meantime, if you're with that group, you just take advantage of what they're doing and you practice the basics on them. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. But your simple beat sounds good. So, you know, you got one, two, a three, four, a one, two, a three, four, a one, and soon it becomes natural. So, of course, when you're playing like this, it's impossible to do it. One, two, three, four, one, you can't do it. You know? So what you do is you play. That's why I think I explained to you about how guys write it. Uh, in the old days, they used to write. Uh, I was taught, okay, quarter. You always start on a quarter. Bang. And a dollar eight and a sixteenth, a quarter, dollar eight, sixteenth. That's where I was taught. Then when you start writing commercial stock music, I don't know if you ever have seen that. Like some of the old Glenn Miller arrangements, or Duke Ellington arrangements, or I don't have to arrange, they had stock music, it's called stock music. God would write on the range, you go to the store and the music store and you bought it for 14, 15 pieces man. A dollar, you know. They started writing a quarter, two eighths, quarter, two eighths, quarter, two eighths. Have you ever seen it written like that? Yet? Then some guy came up with a brilliant idea. And what it really was, was a quarter, a triplet with the middle triplet missing. Probably. And that's where the whole relaxed formula came about. Everybody was going to try to play one. And the difference is so small that it's, you know, from the original, from the quarter dotted, dotted eight sixteen, it's so, so small. The only way you can tell the real difference is from playing real slow. Like one, triple, one, triple, one. They say one, two, three. See, you can tell the difference. Then. Mm -hmm. It's like one and, see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Slow, you can tell the difference between the dotted, dotted eight and sixteen and, and the triple with the middle triple and this. Everybody, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, but what it did is, guys started concentrating on so much on trying to play it like the quarter that it started relaxing too much. So you never got any drive. You know? I don't think you got any. And when it went into fusion, well, it didn't matter. 